Uh, okay, the next presentation will be given by Mr. Adam Robinson from the University of Edinburgh. Um, Mr. Robinson is a lecturer in mechanical engineering uh, within the Institute for Energy Systems at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, yes, as, a, as well as leading a researcher group of six doctoral students and a post that looking in ultra high temperature thermal storage, transfer, and conversion. He is currently founding a company to commercialize the technology developed at Edinburgh University, which is energy free. Okay, so. Okay, Mr. Robinson, you are welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to change the presentation to answer some of the questions that you've been asking. Uh, so I'll skip through some stuff and give you more information on other stuff to, to see what it looks like your appetite is. Uh, but generally this presentation starts by uh, sort of advocating why we might be interested in dynamic systems for, for, thermal, for, for converting heat to electricity and thermal energy storage systems. Uh, so just for those who don't know what, what heat engines are, and sort of by dynamic systems, I guess we mean systems with moving parts. I guess a lot of people understand heat engines. We, in most cases, we compress the gas, we then heat the gas, then we, uh, we extract energy as we, from that expansion, and then use that mechanical engineering energy that we've created to turn a, uh, turn a generator, sorry, I'll stand over here, turn the generator and create some electricity. Uh, and, and say the, the sort of gas turbine systems that, and steam turbine systems I'm going to talk about, I'll explain, I'll explain how they work later. Uh, so so why, why would we use heat, in, heat engines? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the main reasons why we'd be interested in heat engines are a kind of history. I mean, they're really very well understood. The, the first heat engines were developed in ancient times. The first commercially useful heat engines that generated electricity were at the end of the end of the 19th century, uh, first one being a, a gas-powered steam, uh, sorry, a, a coal-driven steam plant uh, generating electricity for the Edison Electrical Light Company. So we've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, and what, what that means is that we understand uh, heat engines very, very well. Uh, and because of that, they've become very reliable because we've, we've spent 100, over 100 years developing them and understanding them. Uh, they're also available not just at large scale but at all scales. I think I think people have developed nano heat engines uh, all the way up to the big, the world's biggest in single engines, which are the the steam turbines that extract energy from nuclear power plants up to up to sort of 1600 megawatts uh, power. Uh, I think they're the biggest. They're certainly the biggest heat engines, but they may be the biggest individual electric generators. Uh, so they're available at all scales. Incredibly well developed very widely implemented. So 80% of our energy at the moment is, is developed by thermal power plants worldwide. Uh, about 30% of that is gas turbines and, and combined cycles and then the 70% is, is steam turbines, whether they're nuclear or, or, or coal or some other means. So they're very available and that means that a lot of them already exist out there, uh, but also that the infrastructure to build them at all scales exists to support them, the, the knowledgeable people who can fix them are, are there, they're available. So that's why we're interested. And they're also very optimised. So as I say, with the, this is a kind of double-edged sword. They're optimised, great, we understand them, but actually it, the double-edged sword is that we're probably never going to, we're never going to push their efficiencies much beyond what they are now. And, and so the, to the question of why wouldn't we use heat engines, uh, the first being limited efficiency. Uh, we are, we, we've, we've never managed to get anywhere near Karna efficiency. The, the best gas turbines at the moment, which are probably the most efficient heat engines in a combined cycle mode, uh, are at 64% with a sort of maximum temperature about 1650 degrees. And that's what we've got to. That's actually a little better than the, it's nowhere near Carno, but it's better than the, the end of reversible efficiency. So it's 2% better than, than if we've not recovered any reversibilities in the process at all. So, so, so we've got limited efficiency. Also, a lot, and again, this, I guess this is the point that drives a lot of your work on, on sort of solid state solutions is that moving parts are never a good idea. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'd, I'd like to make, I'm quite happy to make myself redundant by getting rid of all moving parts. They, they cause far too much trouble. Uh, but, but, yeah, so heat engines generally have moving parts, and, and that's a bad thing. If you, if you can avoid them, you should. If you can't, well, that's it. So, so now I'll talk about exactly 
what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to talk about gas and steam turbines as the most prevalent heat engines there are. We could talk about other cycles, other, other things like Stirling engines, other, other cycles, but I'm not going to because the whole point and the advantage of these systems is that they're out there, they're working, and some of the other systems aren't, so hopefully by the time they would be developed, you've developed your, uh, your uh, solid state solutions to supplant them. So, uh, and I'm also going to talk about heat exchangers, because uh, gas turbines, you need some way of getting the energy into the gas to then drive the, drive the steam or gas turbines. So heat exchangers are really important. I'm going to talk a little bit about failing modes. I'm going to skip through that a bit. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what the future directions are. What I'm also going to do now is, I wasn't planning to talk about heat pumps, but I've, I've been set up to do that, so I've put another slide in, and I'll talk about uh, ultra-high temperature heat pumps and what, what the state of the art in that area is, really. Uh, and I'll, I'll make some conclusions. I'm also, at the end, so after my conclusions, I'm going to carry on talking if I can, uh, and talk about the research we're doing at Edinburgh, and also the commercialisation we're doing at Edinburgh. So, so I'll talk a little bit about the products that we're producing with our, 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 our spin-out company that was Energy Cubed and now is Exergy Cubed due to uh, registering the company and all that. Uh, right, so gas turbines. Uh, gas turbines in general, same as the cycle I showed earlier, you compress some gas, you then heat it, and then you, that expanded gas you extract mechanical energy from. Uh, they're very big. In general, the most efficient ones have series of individual compressors, actual flow compressors, are the most efficient ones, yet you have a compressor, you have some means of heating the gas, you have a turbine, that turbine j turns a shaft which powers the compressor and also has some net energy left over to, to, to generate some electricity with a, with a generator. Uh, how would you integrate a gas turbine to thermal energy storage? Uh, quite simple, uh, you would, you would uh, generally, the normal cycle is to burn combust uh, fuel in a, in a in a combustion chamber to heat the gas. Uh, what you can do is you can take that through a thermal store instead, or you can do a hybrid of both, where you, if you, for example, depleted your thermal store, you can then you can then heat it, reheat it up to the operating temperature of the gas turbine with with a fuel. It doesn't have to be a natural gas; it could be uh, a, a green fuel like hydrogen. Uh, and also, you can put various valves around so that you can bypass these components if you need to to lower lower pressure losses. So we can also, that, that was an open cycle, so that's an air breathing gas turbine. Uh, that's obviously easy, there's lots of air about to use. And we also develop uh, closed cycle gas turbines and there's about, there's been about 15 of these built in the sort of power generation scenario, mostly for compact nuclear power plants or, or heat recovery. Uh, and what we can do is we can, instead of exhausting the gas to atmosphere, we can, we can bring it back round through first to recuperate, to try and get some energy back into the compressed gas before it gets to the combustion chamber or gas turbine, and then a pre-cooler to bring it down to its original original condition. So we can do closed cycle and open cycle for gas turbines. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, generally, generally the higher the compression ratio, uh, the higher the temperature, the more the more energy dense and the more efficient it's going to be. So these are some numbers based on based on turbines that already exist right up to where we are now, which is sort of maximum performance, sort of approaching 40, 40 times. Uh, compression ratio and, and, and 1650 degree uh, turbine entrance temperature. Also, another point to make is that they get more efficient with scale. Uh, a lot of this is because you can implement more features as, as you go up in scale, uh, you, get, you go from a point where, where centrifugal compressors, where is that, where is that cheap? Uh, for, for low scale, they're inefficient, so at some stage you transition to actual flow compressors and gain that efficiency, but yeah. We, we have gas turbines right from, I think the smallest one is 500 megawatts, it fits in a suitcase. Uh, the biggest one is, is uh, approaching 500 megawatts, uh, and those are the big, the big uh, power generation turbines which will also have a combined cycle on their exhaust. So in terms of performance, things that you need to know about gas turbines, they have start-up times. Uh, this, this obviously matters operationally. Uh, if you want to start at the biggest gas turbines, that's going to take you 30 minutes to full load. The micro gas turbines, that can be a lot quicker. You can do that in a minute to full load, uh, but that, that's scale dependent. Uh, same, same trend with ramp rates. Uh, you can obviously ramp up big gas turbines slowly and, and small tur turbines fast in turn compared to their total capacity. 
uh, and you also also part load operations an issue. You can't run these below a certain point. There's a certain point where where the amount of energy that you're generating to turn your turbine is less than the amount that you need to drive your compressor, and it's no longer self-sustaining. Uh, generally, power plants are limited to about 40% as their minimum operation based on their capacity. Uh, you can. This is a lot to do with emissions regulations as well, but, but and the self-sustaining speeds are probably down to about 33%. So that, that's the kind of minimum operation you can get from a, a heat engine. And also frequent cycling, which is what you want to do if you're trying to load follow to back up renewable energy or if you're going to turn this into an energy storage system, uh, they it can significantly reduce the, the lifetime of the components in the gas turbine. So again, free, they're not ideal for frequent cycling. Uh, right, you can also improve the efficiency of your 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 gas turbine by having advanced cycles so you can put in things in like intercoolers uh, in your compressor so you split your compressor up into multiple stages and then cool between them you in, in the context of thermal storage you could probably use some of that as, as low temperature waste heat or, or a low temperature thermal store that that heat could be somewhere between 150 and 300 degrees uh, we also we can also do the similar things in the exhaust where we can split the turbine and, and then do reheat stages and to improve the efficiency and the power output of the engine uh, and, and, and that, that can also be storage integrated in, in our context and, and again we can recuperate uh, on the exhaust as well to get some more energy back out of this. Uh, so yeah, and the other alternative as people have suggested earlier is if you've got a high temperature enough exhaust it, it might be worth putting that through another type of heat engine, a steam turbine to recover some energy and then that's where I'm getting to now so the other steam turbines they don't generally operate at what you describe as ultra high temperatures they're sort of the best steam turbine at the moment is operating at about 620 degrees C uh, about 300 bar pressure uh, obviously that's not going to directly integrate with the thermal storage system but it's always easy to make things colder through dilution or through control and heat transfer. So it might be that a steam turbine is a reasonable extraction cycle for an ultra high temperature store uh, in certain contexts. Again, they're very similar. They their 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 efficiency scales with 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 plant outputs. So right up to these biggest plants you've got, you're getting up to sort of 46 percent efficient. Uh, and that, the reason for that again is because you can put more features in, you can put more reheat cycles in, in, the, in the turbine and, and things like that and, and other, other, other features like uh, uh, cooling your turbine blades with, with, with water to generate steam to redrive the process uh, and the bigger you get the more of that you can do. Uh, yeah, so how would you integrate a steam, a steam turbine? Uh, one of the, the neat ways of doing this is just to use what we call a heat recovery steam generator. At the moment, we use these to turn the exhaust of a, a gas turbine into a into a in, in, into uh, into steam to drive drive a steam turbine. And the multi-stage processes where you have series of heat exchangers, gas goes in here from the exhaust and eventually gets cooled down as it goes through these heat exchangers, which which raise steam. Uh, that's the cycle diagram. The cycle diagram looks really complicated, but actually integrating a the thermal store into this is really easy. All you need to do is blow air through your thermal store heat exchangers and then blow that through this heat recovery steam generator which exists already and that's how you can, that's how you can uh, generate electricity. I think this is probably what Siemens are doing on their e-test technology although they haven't published that. Uh, so yeah, storage integration is really easy. Uh, you could also integrate your storage, your storage directly into your, so your heat exchanger to raise the stream directly into your thermal store. But that's not probably not a good idea. You're probably going to be limited to 620 degrees, uh, so it's not not really an option for for ultra high temperature operation. Uh, you can also again use this as a bottoming cycle uh, for a gas turbine. So there are some great advantages if you if you're planning to put a heat engine with a thermal store. You've got multiple advantages which will improve the efficiency of the heat engine, but po possibly improve the utility of the storage system as well. This is a this is a concentric storage system where you you put concentric masses of thermal masses outside of your main high temperature thermal mass uh, to cap mostly to capture energy that's, that's going to be lost through through thermal losses, uh, and you can use those 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 thermal masses at different temperatures to to improve the efficiency of different bits of your process. So you can do you can you can 
try and recapture some of that lost energy from your thermal storage system by having a, a sequential heating up process for your gas that comes from your compressor and is going to your gas turbine. Uh, turbine. Uh, you can you can put reheat on the on the on the gas turbine uh, on a high temperature thermal mass, and you can do the same on reheat on your on your steam turbine. So you may be able to push your your efficiencies of both those devices up because you've got a close integration with the thermal storage system. You've also got your bottoming cycle. And the last thing, a lot of people have talked about this already, if you, if you can find the use for your heat, then whereas you might have an, effective, an efficiency of 64% for your heat engine, you can now push this up to an effective efficiency, maybe up to 95%, like some of the, some of the, some of the schemes up in Scandinavia, uh, as an effective efficiency. Right. Another thing you can do with a, gas, with, a, with a heat engine, a gas combined cycle gas turbine, is you can use it to transition an energy system. At the moment, you might have, a, you might have your thermal store attached to your steam turbine. Uh, we would have a, the, the thermal store, as you all know, is probably very good for short duration storage. Uh, if you're talking about covering things like the winter peaks, uh, which in the UK are seven times higher uh, than, than the, the sort of summer times, uh, you, you, you probably end up, you, you're probably the best solution to that is going to be uh, hydrogen uh, or at the moment it's kind of covered with natural gas. So you can, you can right now we could have a, a thermal storage system that, that was cheaper than gas hopefully because uh, it's taking in curtailed energy uh, to drive your gas turbine and then when that depletes or you're in a, in, or you're in a sort of winter uh, scenario you can you can run your gas turbine off 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 natural gas or something else whatever your national gas grid runs on uh, you could then you could then start to use as, as you've got more renewables on the grid you can utilize your your thermal store more and more to to take in more and more energy of bigger thermal stores still occasionally backed up with with uh, with natural gas or something like that. And then eventually the sort of future energy system, you've still got the same component in the middle, the, the combined cycle gas turbine, but now you've closely integrated a hydrogen electrolyzer to it, using the waste heat from the storage and the heat engine to, to get a more efficient electrolysis process. That, electro that then goes out to the gas grid and then when you need it, it brings back. You can have a fully green system based on lower cost thermal storage and a higher cost, but, but, but sort of cover winter peaks type hydrogen storage. Right, so uh, I'll talk more about this than I was planning to. Heat exchanges, are, as, as was correctly pointed out from the audience, were are very, very important in this scenario. Uh, what you need is, is very effective heat exchanges. There's, there's some neat solutions like pack beds. Uh, Siemens Heat Test uses pack beds and they just push hot gas through it. You could, you could push gas around all your, all your crucibles of silicon. Uh, as, a, as, another, as another way of creating a kind of cost-effective heat exchanger and meet sort of dual use as combined storage medium and heat exchanger type solution. But, but if, you want, if you want a really high ratio between effectiveness and the volume that this, this heat exchanger takes up, the only way you're going to really do that is to have, have a, a, well, this type of heat exchanger where you've got, you've got a honeycomb type arrangement. Uh, and and the, another thing is that Gas turbines, as they exist, large frame gas turbines, the biggest one we have, the biggest ones we have, they take hundreds of millions of pounds to develop them, and they have a very fine balance between the, the, the compressor and the turbine. And if you were to plunk a heat exchanger in that line, which had a high pressure loss, you would lose that balance, and you might, you, you'll certainly make your gas turbine less efficient. You might stop it from operating at all. So if we're going to, if we're going to get this onto big gas turbines, we, we need to have low pressure loss heat exchangers. Uh, so there's, there's lots of alternatives to that. There's, this is a kind of a solid to gas heat exchanger concept where the outside is connected to your, your storage mass, whether that be a phase change or a, or a sensible uh, solid storage mass. That if you have an intermediate process between, your, between your, your heat engine and your steam turbine, you may have a gas to gas heat exchanger and we have plate heat exchangers and counter current squirrel heat exchangers and all kinds of heat exchangers that are well developed to do gas to gas heat transfer. Uh, in terms of materials, uh, if you're looking at 900 to 600 degrees at the moment, you're probably talking about stainless steels and nickel alloy based things. If you're talking about a six, getting into the ultra high temperature range, you're probably going to be making your heat exchangers out of engineered ceramics. 
aluminium ceramics that we can currently process at a, a decent scale, so things like silicon nitride and aluminium oxide. Looking into the future, uh, the first attempt at what, what the ceramic people describe as ultra-high temperature ceramics, their definition is above three, melting point above 3,000 degrees. Uh, they're, looking at, they're looking at sort of these rare materials at the moment that we've just started to be able to process them, that make them, but they may allow us to push our storage temperature up to 2,500. Looking further into the future, we might be able to use carbon-based uh, heat exchangers, and, and we've got useful engineering performance out of carbon carbon composites at the moment at, at sort of three and a half thousand degrees maximum pretty not particularly loaded systems things like uh, leading edges on hypersonic air, aircraft but there may be a future where we can we can use them on heat exchanges uh, right uh, in terms of failure mode the latest uh, industrial gas turbines are sort of limited to 600 to 1615 degrees Actually, they're using, they're, and, the, and the main mechanism of failure, that's, there's lots of, obviously, it's a huge engineering system with lots of components. They've all got a failure mode. But the ones that are particularly at the cutting edge of material science are things like the, the turbine blades, which generally fail by creep, which is sort of slow deformation over time, which is related to stress and, and temperature. So high temperature and high stress, which is what you get when you're spinning one of these things around at 15,000 RPM in a gas that's 1650 degrees, you, you are going to probably see creep failure. Uh, the allowable metal temperatures in this application at these load rates is sort of 850 to 900 degrees. Obviously something doesn't add up here, you've got 1600 degree gas temperature. So the only way we currently make this work is that the only way we make this safe is by having internal cooling. Uh, so you turn the blade into a heat exchanger and get the heat out of it that way. And we have thermal barrier, coat, barrier gas films uh, that come out of these holes you see in the surface. We also have thermal barrier coats where we put uh, ceramic onto the surface to lower the heat transfer from the system. So we're having to do some really complex things to get these to work at these temperatures. Uh, and it's similar to true the latest steam turbines. They're limited to 620 degrees. You can't cool a, a steam turbine heat exchanger. That would be counterproductive. The big problem they have is that they're also dealing with high pressure, which is why the temperature is limited so much. Uh, and again, creep in superheaters is a key mode and stress corrosion cracking in steam turbines which are, which are seeing uh, the steam is quite corrosive uh, and can do various damage in various ways to, to the components it's in contact with at high temperature. Uh, so I'll kind of, I'm going to skip through this quick. It's kind of a case study for a, an ultra-high temperature heat exchanger. And again, I'll say the sort of heat exchangers we're interested in developing are ones that have very good volume to surface area ratios the bottleneck tends to be not between the outside surface and the storage medium. Uh, the bottleneck is between getting the, the, the energy from the solid into the gas. So this is the type of systems we're interested in going forward. Uh, and, and creep, as I say, it's, it's the slow continuous deformation. It may have a lower threshold. It might be that we can design a system that would last forever. Uh, there's, certainly, there's certainly a point on the creep tables that say if we have have below a certain stress and at a certain temperature range we might have a threshold value. Actually this is not ever being proven, this is something that needs to be researched, uh, but it might be that we can make a heat exchanger that lasts forever, which is good, because one of our key advantages as a collective is that we've got much better life than lithium ion and electrochemistry, so why not try and make all the components so that they last for 25 to 100 years or forever. Uh, that's a very good selling point of these technologies. Uh, and yeah, we've, we've done some modelling that shows that you can, you can get a silicon carbide heat exchanger in this context to last for more than 25 years at, at the sort of conditions you'll see uh, for the highest temperature gas turbines. Uh, oxidation is an issue uh, for, for failure. Uh, again, we've done some modelling which shows that uh, you, could build a, you could build a silicon carbide heat exchanger and, and it, would, it would be within the passive oxidation regime where it, form, it forms a protective film with, with, a, with this is with a, a, an air working fluid and it would again last for a, a really long time. Uh, if you were to push the temperature higher or push the oxygen concentration higher, you might go into the sort of aggressive corrosion regime. And the other thing you need to consider, so we've, we've shown that it's shown that it's fine to push gas through these at very at ultra high temperatures, but actually the outside surface, if we were to use silicon carbide with molten aluminium, there would be active aggressive uh, uh, chemical damage there. So you need to you need to really think about your 
combinations of materials. So if you were going, if you were stuck with molten aluminium, you you might go for a, a, an aluminium oxide heat exchanger. If you've got silicon, you might be okay with a silicon carbide heat exchanger. Uh, yeah. So other failure modes: thermal shock. Uh, we've, we've we've tested thermal shock and shown that that that. Uh, that, that we can sustain in silicon carbide heat exchanger with this geometry, we can sustain a 100 degree kind of non-dimensionalized pressure difference, uh, temperature difference, and we're only actually going to see a, in this operation, we're only going to see a two degree temperature difference in the, in the, in the walls of the heat exchanger. Uh, and so that's, that's not, although it's something we should be aware of, it's, it, it probably would work in this case study. Fracture is, n again, not an issue. A silicon carbide is very, very strong. Uh, to fail under self-weight, which is pretty much the main loading for these types of heat exchangers, uh, aerodynamic loading is low because you've already reduced the flow velocities to a point where, where the, where you don't, well, you don't get high pressure losses. So, so your main, your main failure modes are, are based on self-weight loading, and, and actually you'd need a, a, a crack of 140 meters in a structure this large to. To get to get failure from fracture, so that, that's not an issue either. So talking into future directions, uh, so next generation gas turbines predicted to be up to 1700 degrees C. Next next generation steam turbines up to 720. We might see efficiency go up for combined cycles up to up to sort of 67 percent. We might see steam type cycle efficiencies going up to 50, just above 50 percent in the next generation. And generations of these devices takes decades. So, so, yeah, you're only ever going to see incremental in increases in these technologies, so they're, they're very well developed. Uh, uh, developments in ceramics at the moment might, might cause a step change in, in terms of performance. Uh, but in conclusion, why do we care about heat engines? Again, because they're, they're understood, they're reliable and they're available, and we've got lots of them in operation already. Uh, we can improve the efficiency by close integration of a, with a thermal store. And also, if you, can, if you can find a use for your heat, then the effective efficiency, as you've seen earlier, pushes right up and becomes competitive with other energy storage technologies. So uh, I, was, I wasn't going to talk about heat pumps, but I am now. Uh, so one thing we can do, and I've, I've always thought of this in the context of, of, of trying to uh, lower thermal losses in a, in a sort of concentric multi-stage thermal store. We can actually pump heat uh, up to, to, to higher temperatures. Uh, you probably all know about, co hopefully, about coefficient of performance, where, where sort of household heat pump systems are, are seeing uh, efficient, uh, coefficients of performance up to four, so they're four times better than just, just using electricity with resistance heating. Uh, with a, with a high temperature heat pump, the current state of the art that we might make, if we use the most efficient, if, we, if we're talking about a single phase heat pump, which uses gas only and a sort of reverse braking cycle, then the best efficiency, the best coefficient of performance we're going to see is approaching two in this kind of scenario where we're pumping heat from, from sort, of, um, sort of 1200 Kelvin up to about 1800 Kelvin or something like that. So, so at the moment, we can make high temperature, ultra high temperature heat pumps using the most advanced turbo machinery, uh, but they've got low coefficient of performance. Hopefully, someone will do some research and come up with a way of having multi phase ultra, ultra high temperature heat pumps, and then we might see better COPs, which might make some of the things Alejandro talked about uh, more feasible. Uh, so now I'm going to sort of introduce the research we're doing, and my students are all here, so talk to them if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, Harris is, is looking at high-level energy system model, modeling. Obviously, there's a lot of energy system modeling goes on with thermal storage, but ultra-high temperature thermal stores have particular characteristics, like their thermal losses, uh, their integration with combined heat and power, and, and, and other, other, other sort of cycle advancing features. So, so it's worth looking at them in the terms of how they would fit into the grid. So that's what Harris is looking at. Uh, we've got, we've got. I mean, one of the opportunities with 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 ultra high temperature storage is actually all the all the thermal power plants we've got at the moment. They don't need fuel; they need heat. So we can provide that heat by some of the means, as as, as other people have shown. Uh, and therefore, you can maintain things like grid inertia. Uh, you can take a plant that's already existing and convert it. And Siemens have done some techno-economic analysis on that, and they're saying that. 
that converting an existing coal-fired power plant to a thermal storage system is 10 times cheaper than the equivalent size lithium-ion battery. Uh, so this is really a really profitable way to go. And when 80% of the world's energy is coming from thermal power plants and we here could convert them, that's a great opportunity. So we're actually, Seb is looking at the actual practicalities of this, what we need to do to components like combustion chambers to make this work, using CFD to answer those questions. What this does to emissions, it doesn't just in lower CO2 emissions, it also emission, it reduces the NOx of the, of the gas turbine, for example. So lots of benefits to that. Uh, Tarek is looking at, originally looking at integrating ultra-high temperature storage with CSP, uh, but actually some of the stuff we've learned developing storage systems can be applied to solar receivers and, and we're actually looking at pushing up the temperature of solar receivers as well now as integration uh, with some of the stuff we know. Uh, so it's also a joint project with the University of Adelaide. Uh, Thibaut uh, is, is interested in heat transfer and insulation structures and as someone pointed out earlier, these tend to be radiation dominated and there's a lack of good modeling techniques when you've got radiation dominated systems. So that's, that's what Thibaut is developing. Uh, Aldo is looking at the heat exchangers, the sort of, the sort of high performance, high effectiveness, low volume heat exchangers that we need for, for future UHCS systems if they're going to be integrated with heat engines. Just looking at models to optimize those. Uh, Stuart's just started, but some of, the, some of the geometries of heat exchanger and storage system we want to make, things like spherical, systems need, need, need complex manufacturing techniques and new, new manufacturing techniques to achieve them. So Stuart's looking at potentially additive manufacturing techniques for ultra high temperature materials. Right, so on to commercialization. Uh, so our company, Exergy Cubed, uh, it's just, just forming at the moment. We've just got uh, UK government funding for it and investment for it. Uh, We've got two products really. One of them, one of them is, is, is a, a residential storage system. It's only running at 900 degrees and the reason for that is because we can use metallic components. Uh, but the idea is that once we prove the architecture, we'll push it up into the ultra high temperature range. Uh, and we've got a, a meter, effectively a meter cube box that can store 100, 100, uh, 100 kilowatt hours of, of electricity. We can output that as heat, we can output that through a micro gas turbine and get 22% of it back as, as electricity. Uh, it can charge very quickly, so the initial one charge, it will charge fully in two hours. We think we can get that down to half an hour, which is great if you've got, oh, you've got negative price events that only last for half an hour. Uh, we've, we've got the energy losses of this down to about two kilowatt hours per day, so about 2%. Uh, and the, the advantage this system has is that if it's depleted or if, or if the grid goes, the electricity grid goes down, we can run this whole thing off, off natural gas and then, and then that will provide a backup. So it's good for weak grid scenarios. Uh, it adds resilience to the grid to have these systems. Obviously the point of a small scale system is you can put it next to a place where you've definitely got a use for the heat, someone's household, uh, which tends to be 80% heat, uh, about 10% hot water and about 10% electricity overall. Uh, so yeah, that, that's that. The other, the other opportunity we're working on is the power station conversion market. So, so uh, a shipping containers scale version of the, pretty much the same technology again, now 900 degrees, so we can use metallic components. And again, we can charge very quickly, which is a, a big advantage. And, and this has got thermal losses at about half a percent a day. Uh, if you're backing up solar in Australia, then half a day storage is is pretty good, so thermal losses aren't, aren't a big issue. Uh, Northern Europe, we tend to be backing up wind, so actually we're looking for days and weeks of storage, so thermal losses become really, really important. So yeah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have you got any questions? So thank you very much for a nice presentation, but I'm afraid that we don't have much time for a question, so just maybe one or two questions maximum, okay? Thanks for the presentation. Uh, 
I have two questions I think I'll use all the time. Yeah. The first one you mentioned about heat exchangers and the efficiency. Yeah. Have you analyzed the internal surface roughness against efficiency? Uh, it's a it's a parameter in our heat exchanger model, for sure, surface roughness. Uh, but no, I couldn't tell you for a particular configuration what how much effect surface roughness has. But yes, it's a variable in our models. Okay. Now, the second one is related to you mentioned about turbine and lose efficiency through coatings and so forth. Can you elaborate a bit? Sorry, about well, I can you, you mentioned you? about the turbines uh, yeah. uh, that you have a coatings and cooling uh, in the system, and you have reducing of uh, efficiency. Can you elaborate a little bit about coatings and adhesion and uh, potential uh, detachment from the substrate with the coatings uh, that you so utilize? You're talking about thermal barrier coating. Yes. Uh, I mean. I mean, in, in terms of so what I've tried to stay away from both here and in the chapter is things that are well known in other areas. Uh, so in terms of thermal barrier coatings on, on gas turbines, uh, I think I think they're working pretty well at 1650 degrees. I think they're seen as a way of pushing the temperature even higher. But, but the, the barrier coatings they're using at the moment are pretty good at staying attached. Uh, but, but they've only developed them up into the 1650 degree range. Uh, but again, I'm not, I can't give you a detail, I'm not an expert on thermal barrier coatings. And also I'm a user of gas turbines rather than a, a, a developer of them. So, so yeah, so I don't, I'm, I know what they can do, but not, and know in some ways how they do it, but not what the next step is and what it looks like. But maybe we can have a chat about that afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions?